afternoon, everybody, or morning. I'm Tom Naust uh, from Charleston, as Larry was mentioning. I want to just thank Larry and Steve and everyone else who invited me to come. Um, it's a real honor to get to talk to all you guys. Um, the topic this morning is going to be on making splits. Um, we'll talk about methods and concepts for splitting your overwintered colonies. So who here has just overwintered their first colonies ever? Okay, small percentage. Um, who's made splits in the past? All right, about half or so. Um, who would like to make splits for the first time this year? Okay. So I'll be addressing pretty much everybody, um, but I'm definitely going to focus a little bit on the beginner side of things just to kind of get the juices flowing. Um, first thing here, reasons for making splits. There's a ton of reasons for splits. Here's just a few. If you want to increase your number of colonies, uh, replace your winter losses, provide colonies for other people, improve the characteristics of your bees, and you do that by you know, taking your strongest overwintered colonies, the ones that did the best through winter and came out super strong, those would be the ones that you'd like to split to propagate those genetics. Um, as a vehicle for increasing your beekeeping skills. So the more splits you make, it really helps to dial in the, the concept of the, the critical mass of you know, how many bees and what size split is really going to explode when you uh, make it. To prevent swarming, so if you go in your hive and you've, you've got queen cells, that's an excellent time to make a queen cell split. The resources are right there in front of you. And it'll prevent your parent colony from swarming ideally, and, and you'll have another colony for raising a queen. Um, to requeen, so you can make splits, let them raise up queens, and then you've got queens to use in your own apiary to requeen colonies if you have a queen failure. And increase your honey production. Um, I won't really go into that one too much, but that's kind of, a, a, it's a trick, just like most of beekeeping, tricking the bees into doing what you want, pulling the queen out of, your, out of a strong hive right before a honey flow, and then those bees don't have brood to raise, so you end up making an even bigger honey crop. So when to split? Um, as Larry said, this is really timely. We're getting into split season here. Um, has anyone already made splits? A couple people. Um, I'm waiting until I can get some queens, which um, should happen in mid-March or so. Um, and then, you know, obviously split any hives that have queen cells before then. So as soon as you have drones present, or whenever mated queens are available, that's kind of the, the general rule. You know, if you're if you're making a queen cell split, you know, if you've got queen cells in your hive, then most generally those hives already have drones in there because uh, they've been preparing to swarm for quite some time. Um, and then you also want to make sure that the weather is moderate enough um, if, the, if the overnight lows are, are too cold um, and you make a split, you could potentially you know, chill a bunch of brood and in both your parent colony and your, your split. So you've got to be careful with the weather. Uh, we're, we're definitely getting into the good time of year to make splits. The weather window is looking good for the next couple weeks. Um, so you can use biological uh, cues as well. Um, for me, you know, once the maple blooms, I feel pretty safe making splits. Um, you've got good pollen coming in at that point, and you're most, most generally going to have to feed those splits for quite a while just to get them off the ground. Um, when the parent colony has ample population and resources, and that, again, is something that you just kind of, you learn with experience. Um, a good rule of thumb, if you've got a 10-frame hive, if you've got six or more frames of cap brood, um, it's time to split. Those bees, you know, if you don't do something soon, they're probably going to be up, up in a tree pretty quickly. 
Um, we want to keep them out of the trees and keep them in our boxes. Um, plenty of honey and pollen stores. You know, you, you assess that when you go in, but if, if you've got a, a colony that doesn't have many stores, um, it's probably not an ideal candidate to split. You probably want to start feeding that colony. And the best time uh, for me is before the main nectar flow. So you can let those splits build up on the nectar flow as opposed to having to feed them for a real long time. You know, the sooner you start, the more you're going to have to feed, and the longer you wait, the more you're going to have to feed. So if you can make your splits prior to the main nectar flow, which in the low country for us, you know, end of April, early May, um, that's a, a great time to split your hive. So some important concepts to grasp when you're making splits. Um, you want to ensure that the parent colony and the split have, at a bare minimum, eggs in the colony. Um, if, if, you, if you make a split and you put only cap root in there and you're not queening that with a mated queen, then they're not going to have any resources to make their own queen. Uh, so make sure that at a bare minimum when you're making a split, you've got eggs in both the parent colony and the split, especially if you're going to let that split make their own queen. Uh, they're going to need, need eggs to make a queen. Make sure the parent colony and the split have ample resources. So, I mentioned that before, but you want to make sure that when you make that split, you're leaving enough for the parent colony, you know, at a bare minimum, 15, 20 pounds of honey, uh, but ideally you've got a little bit more. And same, same with the split, you know, when you make that split, if you're doing a five frame split, generally, at, you know, bare minimum, one frame of, of honey and good pollen stores as well. Um, you want to keep the brood nest intact. So when you make a split, if you take your parent colony and you rip it apart and pull a bunch of frames out, and a, a lot of times if you're making splits, you'll be pulling from more than one colony. And when you pull those, those brood frames from your parent colony and put them into a split, you want to make sure to keep that brood nest intact. Um, fairly straightforward concept, and that's, you know, a, a general concept in beekeeping. You don't really want to s separate that brood nest at all. You don't want to put a honey frame with brood on both sides. You want the brood concentrated in the middle and your, your honey and pollen on the outside of the split. Um, you want to account for drift if you're not moving the split to a different bee yard. Uh, one inch and two miles are about the same distance as far as a bee is concerned. Once you get over two miles, then they're going to reorient. Um, most likely, I, I like to do three miles just to keep it safe. Um, but if you're making a split in the same yard, you want to account for drift. And, and what I mean by that is when you make a split, all of the foragers who have already oriented to the parent colony are going to leave that split and go right back to the parent colony. So just account for that when you make the split. There's a few different things you can do. You can swap the split with the location of the parent colony after a week or so, and then that split will collect all those foragers. Um, that's probably the best if you're keeping them in the same yard is to just swap them at some point. And if, especially if, if you make that split and you don't get enough nurse bees in there, and you look in there and the population's real low, then you definitely want to either shake some more nurse bees into that split or swap the location of the split with a stronger hive and collect all those foragers. And the, the concept of critical mass of population, and this is you know, the more, the more that you do it, the more that you learn about what that looks like. Um, when I make a, a split, I try to do a five frame split. And that's two frames of cap brood, one frame of open brood, two resource frames, and then I'll shake in two or three frames of nurse bees as well. Um, if, you, if you don't have enough bees in your split, it's just going to kind of piddle along and it, they won't really grow. Um, and that's not ideal. You want that you want the critical mass population to just explode as soon as you make that split. If you put enough bees in there, they'll grow really, really quickly. 
Uh, if you don't put enough, again, they'll just limp along for, you know, two, three, four weeks uh, before they really get going. So population is really important when you're making a split. So I'm just I'm going to talk about three common types of splits and really focus in on the 50-50 split. And this is a, a great option for anyone who has never made a split before. Some people call it a walk-away split, where you make the split and you walk away and you come back four weeks and check for a queen. Um, I'll also talk about a queen split. And that's where you're introducing a mated queen that you've purchased um, into the split. And that's a great way to get a jump start. Um, she's going to get in there and be released within three days and be laying pretty immediately. And then a, a queen cell split. And that's a, a great method if you, again, are inspecting your hive and you've got queen cells in there. Instead of cutting those queen cells out and trying to prevent swarming in that way, uh, you can take those queen cells, make a split, and let them raise a queen, and then you've got those resources right there in your apiary. So if you, if you have a queen failure, you can just combine that, that split with your parent colony. So a 50-50 split, it, just like it sounds, you're going to take 50% of the brood and move it to a new box, 50% of the honey and 50% of the pollen. Um, you're just essentially distributing those resources amongst two hives. And you can do that right in place. So you've got your parent colony, you put a box right next to it, move 50% of the resources, and the really important thing to do here is to make sure that you're keeping eggs in both the parent colony as well as the split. But doing a 50-50 split allows you to not have to find the queen. Um, if, if, if that's something, you know, that's a, for me at least when I first started, it was a, a challenge to find that queen. So if, you're, if you haven't gotten good at that yet, 50-50 split's a pretty good method. You're just splitting those resources in half between the two colonies and making sure that you've got eggs in each one. And it doesn't matter which one the queen is in at that point because they've both got eggs. So if if the queens, if you move the queen into the split, that's fine. The parent colony has eggs; they can raise a new queen. Um, and then, one method that people like to use is to face the parent colony and the split toward the original hive location. So, if you've got your parent colony and you make your split right next to it, you turn both those hives towards each other, and that confuses the foragers when they're coming back. Um, and it, it helps to distribute those foragers evenly between the two. About a week after you do that, it'd be wise to turn them back, assess the colonies in terms of their population, and if one, again, has a much lower population than the other, you can just swap locations um, midday when the foragers are out, and then that weaker hive will collect all those foragers and you equalize the population that way. Uh, he, he asked how far apart the hives are. Um, again, it, I like a foot, a foot or less is fine. When you face them towards each other, you're talking about? Yeah, about a foot or so. You know, just enough room so they can come in and choose a hive. She asked if, uh, she said her hive's a little weak and doesn't have a lot of honey stores. And she's asking if, if she should wait until they have honey stores to split them. Yeah, it, it sounds like you should. Essentially, and again, that rule of thumb with the, with the cap brood, if you have a 10 frame box, you, you want to have about six frames of cap brood and a huge population of bees. You know, this is the, 
the foaming over is what I like to see my hives do before I split them. So when you go in there and you open that lid and the bees are just foaming over the top, um, that's a good population to split. If your hive's a little weak, it'd be wiser to just feed them and get them strong uh, before you go ahead and attempt to split. If you take a hive that's too weak and you try to divide it into two, then you've got two really weak colonies and, and they're both going to struggle. So definitely make sure that your hive is, is very strong before you try to split it. Um, yeah, and then again, just come back in four weeks later and look for a laying queen in both your hives. And you can come in sooner, uh, but it's, it's advisable, especially if you're doing a 50-50 split and you're letting them raise their own queen. you got to be really careful if you go in there prior to two weeks because they've, they're making queen cells and then you, you risk going in there and ripping those queen cells apart when you're doing an inspection. Uh, so if you're not queening the hive with a mated queen, it's advisable to wait a little bit longer, at least two weeks before you do your first inspection, just to make sure that you're not going in there and ripping queen cells apart. Um, any other questions on that 50-50 split? I think this is a really great method for you know, someone who's never made a split before, and if you've got a, a good, strong overwinter colony, just do the 50-50 split. Sure, she asked to just more explanation on equalizing and the population. So if you, again, if you make that, if you make a 50-50 split and you face them towards each other, that will encourage confusion essentially, and you'll get hopefully a split of the foragers when they come back. Um, but there's still a chance that when you go in there and look, one of the hives will have a much lower population than the other. So if you take those hives and you just midday when all the foragers are out and you swap their locations, then the weaker colony, exactly, same spot, you just swap their exact locations and then the weaker colony will collect that whole foraging force and that will give a huge boost. Um, and that's just that's a general concept too. If you've got a really weak hive, that's a, a good method to you got a super strong hive and a really weak hive. If you swap places, you can really boost the weak hive's population. The really strong hive will have such a, a big population and generally so much cat brood in there that losing that forager force isn't going to set them back too much. Yeah, if you 
don't have a place to move to three miles away, then just leave them in place. You know, that, that was just, a, you know, she was asking essentially when could she move that colony? Yeah. Really at any point after the foraging force is oriented to that location. So after that first week, when you, when you move them, uh, the entrance is facing forward again. You probably want to wait another two days minimum for the foraging force to ori orient to that location before you did move them. Uh, but you know, for most people, if you've only got a couple hives, you're just going to keep it in, in that location. Yeah, he mentioned that if you place a branch or leaves or some obstruction in front of the hive, that'll force the bees to reorient. Um, I, I have never used that method personally. Has anyone used that with success? So, yeah, so we've got people who've used it with success. Um, so instead of that, and that's a, a method too, you know, if you didn't want to face them towards each other, um, you could move your split to a, a new location on the stand, put some branches in front of it, and then ideally the foraging force will not go back to the parent colony. He asked if, what if you waited until after the honey flow to do your 50-50 split? In that case, you're probably going to have to feed that split, um, unless, you know, if, you, if you've come through the honey flow and you've got a very, very strong hive, let's say double deep with a, a medium or two full of honey, uh, which wouldn't be uncommon, then you, you could probably overwinter both colonies with the stores that they've made. Um, so you really just have to make that assessment after you, uh, or when, when you split them. Because um, after the honey flow, if there's not going to be any left, if they don't have, you know, for me, I like to keep a minimum of 40 pounds of honey going into winter. Um, so if you, if you don't have that much, you're just going to have to feed to get them up to that weight before winter. Okay. So moving on to a queen split. And this is definitely my favorite method of making splits because uh, it really... You can, you can have your parent colony, pull a split out of it, uh, make a five frame nucleus colony essentially, and still get honey production out of that parent colony. So with a 50-50 split, you're most likely going to have to let both those colonies build up. You know, there's a chance that they could, could make some honey for you that year, but most likely not. Um, by making a queen split or a, a nu nucleus colony, you have the potential to have your parent colony still make a, a pretty good crop of honey in that season. So to make a queen split, you're going to move a frame of eggs, two frames of cat brood, two frames of honey and pollen into your new hive, uh, making sure to leave the queen in the parent colony. So that's the ticket when you're, when you're making a, a split that you're going to introduce a mated queen to. Yes, he asked if uh, you want to put those frames in the middle and empty frames on the outside. Yes, you always want to keep the brood together and then fill out your box with the empties on the outside. Um, generally, you put it right in the center. You could have it on either side. I guess that would be fine. Um, but I like to center mine right in the center. I actually use five frame nuke boxes. So I'll make a bunch of these five frame nukes the day before I get queens. Um, and then after 12 to 24 hours, you introduce a queen into there. And then that colony has a huge head start on a 50-50 split because they're not needing to make a queen. Um, and they can take right off. As soon as they release that queen, she's laying, your brood's hatching out, and it's growing rather, rather quickly. If you were to make a five frame split, this strong, you'd want to put it directly into a 10 frame box. Um, most of the splits that I make will be a little weaker than this, but if you're just starting out and you're just making splits for the first time, the stronger you make them, most likely the better success you're going to have. Um, that leads me to the second point, shaking additional nurse bees off of open brood. 
So you make that split, you've got two frames of brood, a frame of eggs, two frames of honey and pollen. Shake minimum two additional frames so you've got a nice big population of bees in there and that'll just really help with how quickly that hive will be able to grow. Um, and then again, be very, very careful.
Static. <laughs> 